in like energy generation? Is it something that the Sedoni Co is going to have to tackle with? Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out and joining us tonight uh, for this conversation on housing. Uh, my name is James Lewis and I am the community relations coordinator for the Zone In Project. And uh, without further ado, I just want to introduce you to uh, Zoning Chair, President Pro Tem, uh, Rob Dorns. Thank you, James. Well, first of all, why don't you give yourselves a round of applause because it is absolutely beautiful outside right now. <laughs> and you've chosen to be inside talking about zoning right now. So give yourself a round of applause. We get like seven of these days a year in Columbus, Ohio. So it says a lot that uh, you're here this evening talking about this incredibly important topic. Um, so it's great to see so many folks out here tonight. Uh, I know there's a number of uh, friends and community leaders that are in the crowd tonight. So I appreciate people being here to lend their perspective. Uh, so if you don't know who I am, my name is Rob Dorans. I'm the President Pro Tem of Columbus City Council. But most importantly to this discussion, I'm the chair of our zoning committee. And you're here because uh, obviously we are talking about modernizing the zoning code here in Columbus. Uh, this code, uh, the original part of it, goes back over 70 years. So when we think about things that happen in governments, we're not doing a lot of the things the same way that we did them 70 years ago, are we? And um, when we think about the growth, the change of Columbus, uh, land use is at the heart of all of those things. And I want to acknowledge something sort of upfront. Uh, change is scary. To the human condition, change is a disruption to what your everyday life is, and it can be intimidating. Um, it can be you know, uncomfortable. Um, but Change is happening in Columbus every single day. Change is gonna be happening for decades to come in Columbus because of the growth that our, our, our community is experiencing. So really, uh, we have to change with it. And when we think about our land use policies, uh, those are at the heart of what Columbus is going to be five, 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now. And outdated policies that uh, had impacts on the last 70 years, we'd like those not to have the same legacy impacts that they have moving in, into the next 70. So we're at the outset of this discussion here tonight. Uh, this is the first of a number of different community forums all across the city of Columbus, really to have the ability for engaged residents to bring ideas, thoughts to us about what they want to see in their neighborhoods, how they want to think about that change, how it's going to manifest on their block, on their main street, uh, within their certain communities. And we're going to talk a lot about here tonight about corridors. We like to refer to these as sort of the main streets all across of Columbus. These are um, so many different places, whether or not it's you know, High Street right here in Clintonville, or whether it's Broad or East Main and in Near East Side. Uh, these are areas that are high transit corridors. These are places that, again, are sort of the heart and soul of so many neighborhoods across Columbus. That's why we're starting there. That's why when we think about updating our zoning code, it's going to places across the city in these corridors and these main streets to really uh, examine what do we want to encourage? What, how do we produce more of the walkability, the, the types of neighborhoods that folks want to see uh, all across in Columbus. And I'll leave you with, with this stat when we think about the change that is coming. Columbus is uh, producing about 18,000 new jobs every single year, yet we're only producing about 5,000 housing units. Now I went to law school, so I wouldn't have to do any math. Um, but it doesn't take a lot of math to figure out when you think about supply and demand, how out of whack that is right now. So when we think about how do we encourage certain types of goals in our community, it's no secret the conversation that is happening around housing, affordable housing, market rate housing in general. And certainly those types of discussions are certainly tied to this uh, update, modernization of our zoning code. Um, but it is really important to emphasize, we have not made decisions at all. That's why we're here tonight. That's why we're gonna be portions across the city. We think we have good ideas, uh, but we know that community members all across the city of Columbus also have good ideas, and that's why we're here tonight. Um, and we're gonna continue this conversation throughout this year and likely into next year, because uh, we know that if we're gonna do something that hasn't been done in 70 plus years, we wanna do it right, and we wanna make sure that we're as being community-minded and focused, because not every answer uh, that we come out of this when we uh, adopt legislation, we don't want it to be a one-size-fits-all. Unfortunately, a lot of ways that our zoning code is written right now, it's a one-size solution for the entire city of Columbus. And that has manifested itself in rezonings and variances that come before Columbus City Council every single Monday night. And if any of you have trouble sleeping, I highly recommend you come down to Columbus City Council at 6.30 on Mondays for the zoning committee meeting. We'll put you right to sleep. 
Um, but it is unsustainable, the amount of thousands of variances and rezonings that come through because of the growth and change of our city. So when we think about how we're going to modernize this, that is certainly something that in which it's going to have to make sure that, again, we're right-sizing this for every single portion of the city to make sure that we're bringing the community along with us, but also the expectations of that change that's going to happen in every nook and cranny of the city, whether we like it or not, uh, that that change is as reflective of the community that exists there right now. So I ask you all to have an open mind. I appreciate you all being here tonight. Um, and have an open mind and, and be as, as uh, advocates for, for your neighborhood, for your community as you can be. Uh, like I said, this is not an end of anything. Uh, this is the beginning. And uh, it is my goal as the zoning chair to help guide this process through council. And certainly we're gonna hear from a number of folks from the administration tonight whose job it is day to day to, to really do the, the tough work in which they roll up the sleeves with our folks who are experts in this. But their expertise needs to be influenced and needs to be imparted upon by folks in communities all across the city. So um, appreciate your advocacy being here tonight and this is not an end. And if anyone wants to get a hold of me after this meeting or on anything else, all my content information is on the City of Columbus uh, Council website. You can go there, you can get my, my email, my phone number, all that kind of thing. Email is generally a little bit easier, but if you're old fashioned and you wanna give me a call, uh, we'll, we can make that work too. But um, please make sure you reach out to, to me about this topic or any other. Certainly happy to um, try to help you out with any situations we have. Um, but I'm gonna now turn the mic over to Kevin Wheeler, who I'm gonna forget his official title, but he gets annoyed when I say this, but he's like the Yoda of uh, land use planning in the city of Columbus and city planner. He's like the calmest, um, you know, most wisdom uh, imparted person that I know on this topic. And he's really leading efforts internally at the city and we're, we're um, very fortunate to have him in this role at such a critical time. So with that, thank you for being here and I look forward to hearing from you all. Kevin? Thank you, council member. Right. Yes, and um, I'm told that we found some money back by the snack bars. If you know the denomination and you tell me that, we'll give it back to you. <laughs> um, thank you for coming. This is a great turnout. Obviously, as you, you saw, as we've been adding chairs as people come in, um, it's fantastic to see mo so many folks. Um, I'm just gonna, give you a brief overview of the larger project and then Aaron Prosser is gonna talk specifically about housing because there's such a strong intersection between housing and zoning. And then we're gonna have a lot of time for folks to kind of work through these questions at the tables and there are a number of us here tonight who can um, be walking around the room and talking to individuals as well. So the council member mentioned, and you all know, I mean, you just, you see the papers, you see the news, the city and region are growing. We have Intel and the um, Honda LG battery plant here on the left. The right is just a simple bar chart graph of population increase. It's a pretty straight line. We saw 120,000 new, 120, new residents in Columbus in the last 10 year period. That's the city itself, not the region. So population growth, that's brought housing pressure. For those of you who read the uh, Clinton Bill Spotlight, you saw the article about breaking the million dollar barrier. Um, we're, we're all experiencing that pressure and, and Aaron's gonna talk more about that. Um, you know, change is a given, it's going to happen. It's just a question of how we respond to it. Do we guide it? Do we let it happen to us? Uh, we think we have an important obligation and an opportunity to, to work to guide that change. And so work's underway now to bring improved transit to the city. Some of you have heard about the Link Us project. Aaron's gonna talk about housing. We also have a climate action plan that, um, we're, we're, uh, excuse me, that's already been released to try to position the city for resilience. And then we're gonna talk about zoning specifically. Many of you may already know this, but just as a quick refresher for those um, who don't, zoning regulates how property is used, where buildings are placed, regulates things like parking and similar standards. It is distinct from policy. So a land use plan is policy, zoning is a, is a regulation, it's law. It can encourage or discourage investment and development. And like restrictive covenants and redlining, for those of you who are familiar with those, those terms, zoning's been used um, and is still used in, in some circumstances to exclude folks, which obviously has a really um, lasting impact in terms of opportunity. 
zoning equals a map plus text. It's a two-part two part thing. So every property in the city of Columbus, and there I think are 290,000 of them, give or take, is zoned something. And you look at the map and that tells you what it's zoned. You look at the city's code to tell you what's allowed on that property. The council member mentioned variances. Variances are circumstances where you've gotta, gotta figure out a way to build a project that maybe everybody wants to see, but the code just doesn't work. And so um, in many cases, you have to also look at the specific site and what unique conditions are there. Columbus first adopted zoning in 1923. At that point, we had five land use districts. I think we have close to 50 now. There was no parking requirement. The lowest height limit was 50 feet. Um, it was a very simple code. And we have not comprehensively updated it since the 50s. So it got updated in the 50s, but it's been since then that we've really taken it soup to nuts and said, what, is, what should this be for our city? This is a map of Columbus in 1950, and I think the thing that's fascinating about this isn't just the city's growth. I mean, you know what we look like now. That's just 40 square miles. Today we're 220. That's 276,000 people. Today we're over 900,000. We'll hit a million in the next census. Um, but look at the suburban communities around us. Dublin is fewer than 300 people. There's been a lot of growth and change, and I think this gets back to this. We don't have the luxury of saying we don't want change. We have to figure out how we, how we manage it. So the zoning code doesn't support our community's aspiration to be an equitable and thriving city. It's not getting the job done. We did an assessment that concluded in the fall of 2021. It's on our website. If you see any of us, we can direct you to it as well. It'll give you lots of background, more than you may want to know about the challenges of our current code. But the conclusion is we need to update it. Our goals as we update the code, obviously we want to be modernized. We want it to support growth that prioritizes uh, environmental and economic sustainability to address housing, jobs, transit. We want thoughtful investment in neighborhoods, particularly those that ex expressed or experienced segregation in the past and harm. We want to guide design and development of our main streets because we know that design is an important part of this, this uh, question. And then we want to do everything we can to make the code and the process as fair and as predictable and accessible as possible. So where do you begin? It's a big city. Um, it's a, com it's a complex code. So you can't do everything at once, so we're starting with the main streets of our community. And I'm using main streets uh, sort of in a, as a general descriptor. Places, these are places we believe where improved transit, housing options, and jobs can be focused. These are places that have infrastructure now. Uh, these are places that are largely suited for change. Community plans across the city recognize the importance in the role of these corridors. It, but the current zoning represents a lot of barriers to seeing what you all want. Folks say something as simple as a, you know, a coffee shop occupying a vacant building. You know, there are all kinds of zoning reasons sometimes why that can be really challenging. And that's just among the simpler problems that we face. This code update is gonna look at housing, commercial uses, as well as standards. Um, for th th such as uh, parking along these corridors. To repeat the council member, we're not going into the neighborhoods with this phase. We're focusing on the main streets. This is a map of the focus areas. If you go on our website, there's an interactive map that you can go down to the parcel level. There are 62 corridors and nodes across the city. This is a synthesis. We chose these areas based on a combination of factors. Where do we have transit service? or where do we hope to have better transit service in the case of Link Us? Where do we have land use recommendations that support mixed use or higher density multifamily? Where do we have existing zoning that supports those kinds of uses? And again, um, focusing on um, transit in terms of Link Us, we're looking at some corridors like the Northwest, for instance, that we're, we're hoping to see improved transit as we work with CODA and county and other partners. When we looked at these areas, there's about 140 miles. There are 1,000 variances in place just to do things that many of us think would be 
you know, no-brainers. That's not a sustainable pattern, and that tells you that the base code is, is problematic. It's also the case that 35% of these, excuse me, 80% of these areas have a height limit that's the same as a single-family neighborhood. Um, and we'll talk more about those things as we move through this process. But I think the main thing to recognize is that this is a start, not an answer. We don't have a, a proposal at this point. Um, there's going to be a lot more analysis, a lot more community conversation before we move to a proposal stage. At this point, I want to introduce to you Aaron Prosser. Aaron is the Assistant Director for Housing Strategies for the City and uh, a city planner who has lots of experience with the intersection of housing and zoning. All righty. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, I want to start, you guys are here to zone in on housing, right? This evening, that's kind of the focus of things that we're going to talk about as it relates to this um, effort that we're all undertaking together to update our zoning code in the city of Columbus. And what I'm going to start with is just talking about the challenge that we're facing, right? A lot of the things you guys have heard and is kind of part of our conversation we're having, not just in the city of Columbus, but in the region in total, about the changes that are here in our Columbus region and what that means for all of us and how we're going to do it better than our peer cities, right? How are we going to be the region that really gets it right and allows ourselves to economically grow but also accommodate all of our new neighbors and make sure there's places for our existing neighbors to be as well. And the zoning code's a really important part of that, but I'm going to talk about some of the other ways we're going to be addressing housing as well. Get me clicker. And so, you know, I think this is a stat the council member referenced earlier. One of the things I hear in my travels sometimes is if we just stopped building so much housing, we wouldn't have the population growth we're seeing. That's some feedback I get oftentimes. And what's really driving our population growth is this incredible set of opportunities that are coming into central Ohio through the jobs that we're adding, not just in the city of Columbus, but in the region in total. Those opportunities are bringing folks not just from inside the state of Ohio, but now outside the state of Ohio, coming to our community, looking for those opportunities, and they will need a place to live. And so as we think about how we accommodate those new folks and preserve the folks that we have in our community, those are some of the things we're going to talk about. We add about two and a half jobs, and we're only adding one house. In the best case scenario, if we were keeping pace, if you look around the country, we want to be adding about one house for every one and a half jobs we add. And that would be a really comfortable pace of making sure that we have housing for these new residents. Because we've been underbuilding for so long, we're really looking forward as a region, and this is not just within the city of Columbus, but as a region, we need to be adding close to one to one at this point to make up the ground that we've lost in the last decade of underbuilding and to make sure that we're accommodating the new folks that are coming into the community. This is a really important slide. And what we have in Central Ohio is a challenge for some of our residents, right? We're seeing folks that are not able to enter home ownership because the price points are getting high and the inventory is getting low. Those are challenges faced by some of our community members. There are also people in our community for whom this is a crisis, right? There are folks, the most vulnerable among us, who are facing longer stays in our shelter system because we cannot find them a unit. They are facing evictions more likely in any time in the past. Every month I get an, an eviction update and it is high. It is the highest it's been every time I get that email. Every time. We have the amazing uh, emergency rental assistance right now, which is keeping a lot of people housed, but that is not a good condition that we're seeing. And so as we think about the housing challenges, not all of us are immediately feeling the impacts of the housing scarcity that we have in our community, but to be clear, lots of folks in our community are feeling it and are having those um, impacts really part of their day-to-day -day life. I think this is really important. I'll talk a little bit about it a little bit later, but what we want to talk about is that housing is affordable in Central Ohio. I think I should, oh, no, I'm back. Housing is affordable in Central Ohio. We're going to talk a little bit about what affordable means, but what it means is that you and your family are not paying more than 30% of your household income on your housing expenses. Ideally, probably a lot lower than that. If any of us did our personal budgets, we may not be hitting that 30%. 30% is really where you're going to start making sacrifices. The inability to pay for childcare, the inability to have reliable transportation, other challenges for your family. So we want to keep that number under 30%. But I don't just want you paying less. I want to make sure that you have options throughout the region, right? We want to make sure that you and your family get to choose where you want to live based on what you need. You want to live close to your in-laws because they help with child care. You should have a place. You want to live in a particular school district. You should have a place. Those are options that we should have extended regardless of whether or not you're the CEO of a company or a social worker in our community. 
I also want to make sure that the housing meets your family's needs. It is not affordable if you're paying less than 30%, but you are doubled up with your sister's family. That is not what we mean by affordable. We want to make sure it meets your family's needs as well. And then finally, we can't ignore the ways in which housing is our primary way to build wealth in this community, right, in this country. As we look at the opportunities for home ownership, we're sl it's slipping away from us. And that is an impact felt by a lot of our young people in our community that are starting to think about home ownership and looking out into the price points right now, they don't have a lot of opportunity. And so now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about the Columbus housing strategy and kind of where zoning fits into that piece because there's a lot of other things going on. Um, I think we all wanna be really clear that zoning is not the solution to our housing crisis. It is a key part of our toolbox, but it is not the thing that will solve housing. And so as we look across, we wanna think about all the opportunities we've got. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna build, right? Again, back to that underbuilding we've done for the last decade, we need to find a place for all these new folks that are choosing our community. We're gonna talk a little bit specifically about how that impacts our neighborhoods. We wanna make sure we have a diverse set of housing. Um, there's always a point, I'm gonna do it kinda early this evening, where I throw my own mom under the bus, right? She is living in the house I grew up in. My brother and sister and I have been gone for 25 years. She stayed in her house, not because it fits her needs or makes sense for her right now, but that's where her social network, that's where all her friends are, that's where she wants to be, but she lives in a 1960s subdivision. Every house is just like hers. There wasn't another option, there wasn't a place for her to go. And so now, she's in a house that doesn't make sense for her, and there should be a family in that house, right? She should have had the opportunity to move to something that made sense for her and allow a family to come back into that house. So we're gonna be building. But building alone isn't gonna do it, right? We can't just focus on the overall supply. We have to be targeted as well to make sure some of the most vulnerable in our community, some of the folks that we wanna make sure have a place in our community have a place. And one of the things we're gonna do is preserve. And this really falls into three categories. One is our low-income homeowners, right? They are vulnerable right now. I think we've all seen the ads or the articles coming out with the auditor and the impending increase to all our property taxes. There are folks in our community that will not be able to absorb that increase and they will lose their housing. That is a real thing, and as we look at the opportunities to work with our friends at the State House to, to deal with some of those property tax implications, that's really important. We also have our renters, where they are d unstable right now, right? They have a landlord that may want to bump their rent, uh, you know, by 100% out of the blue. And how do they maintain that? How do they make that up? How do they stay in that unit? Again, we have amazing things like emergency rental assistance right now, but how do we look at a longer term structure? Um, and then we want to preserve the existing affordable units in our community, right? We've got things in our community that are affordable now, but for a renovation, but for a change of hands, we're going to lose those units. We're going to invest. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys are aware the Columbus voters voted in November to allow the city of Columbus to borrow up to $200 million to support affordable housing. And we're going to talk about what I mean by affordable housing, but what it is is a public dollars going to a project so that we can make sure it's income restricted, so the house, the family that's in that unit pays no more than 30% of their income, and then secondly, that it's protected for a long period of time. So we're going to be using those $200 million over the next couple years to just add new units into our community for those families. And then the final piece is just include, right? We have to look at how, not just in the city of Columbus, but in the region in total, that there are those economically diverse communities, right? That again, regardless if you're a CEO or a social worker, you have a place in our communities, and that's really important. The top bullet point is the one that we're focused on right now, and that's really looking at our regional partners, not just the other jurisdictions in the suburban communities, but our private sector as well as our uh, nonprofit sector and how we can all come together to think about a regional solution to our housing challenges. So those are the big, that's the big framework. And there's lots to do under that framework, right? There's things that city council is working on. There's things that our partners are working on. There's a lot of work going on around the housing space right now. And as you can see, we've circled just the one piece in this list, right? Stay over here. See, I want to point at things. That's my challenge. Okay, I'm going to stay over here. The, it, the, as we circled right here, updating the zoning code is a piece of how we're going to address our housing. And this is specific to the city of Columbus. Um, and again, working with our regional partners as well. So I mentioned earlier, we're gonna talk a little bit about what we talk about when we talk about affordability. This is a terrible graph, especially for those of you in the back, and I apologize. This will be available on the Zone and website, so if you guys wanna take a look in greater detail. But what we have is a list of area median incomes. And what I've got are the individual incomes for families in our community. These are, 19, these are 2022 numbers, we will get 2023 shortly. 
but really looking at what we mean by who we need to serve in our community. It is becoming increasingly challenging for new construction because of the expense of it, right? Capital is expensive, lumber is expensive, labor is expensive. New projects are very expensive. Those new projects cannot be built and then charge rents that are affordable for our families that are between that 30 and 80% area median income. The math just doesn't work. And so we take our things like our affordable housing bond package, we take partners, um, Carly Booz is here from Affordable Housing Alliance, all of her members are going out into the community and building new units with public dollars that subsidize that project cost and allow us to provide units for those folks. Everything above that is something that generally speaking you can still find housing around Central Ohio and meet that price point that's a slowly and quickly slipping away. It's quickly, not slowly. Um, and then when we get to the folks in our community that are below that 30% area median income, we're really looking at not only project subsidy, but also making sure that we're uh, having ongoing rent subsidy for them, right? Because the rents they're gonna be able to pay are so low that we're gonna need that ongoing rent subsidy as well. The zoning code, especially in its current form, doesn't speak specifically to affordability, right? These are types of housing and how we invest in them and how we finance the project, not necessarily what it falls under in the zoning. Okay, so what can zoning do to help? So now I'm really zoning in on housing. So we kind of talked about the big framework, we talked about the overall toolbox, and then we're gonna talk about some specific ways the zoning code can be impactful in thinking about our overall housing affordability in our city. One, we wanna improve the overall housing affordability. We're gonna talk about back to that supply side, right? Back to how many units we need. We're gonna talk about lowering displacement pressure, right? There is going to be churn and change in a lot of our communities, but how do we relieve that pressure on neighborhoods that are seeing a lot of change and how can the zoning code help us do that? And back to my mom who's sitting in a house that is inappropriately large for her, we wanna talk about a variety of housing. And zoning is a really important tool. I'm sure you guys have heard a lot about the idea of how much we zone in this country around single family homes, right? That we've really leaned into that space and what we can do with the zoning code update is think about, are there other types of housing in our community that would meet the needs of our young professionals? I'm sure a lot of folks in here have kids that are graduating from college and starting to look for apartments and there's not a lot out there. And there's not a lot available to them, so how can we meet their need? How can we look at families that wanna age in place? All of those different options are part of the zoning conversation. Okay, another terrible graph, especially for those of you in the back. I'm gonna highlight a couple of things. This is the difference between 2010 Central Ohio and 2020 Central Ohio. These are regional numbers, not City of Columbus. I put them up there. My parents moved here in 1980. The distance between 1980 Columbus and today Columbus could not be greater. Right? This is an extraordinary town and we are seeing this extraordinary change. A statistic I love to give, last decade between 2010 and 2020, this region added 236,000 new residents. This region just behind us on that list that added 225,000 was the New York City region. More people chose to move to Central Ohio than New York City in the last decade. When you look at a place like the city of Chicago, they lost 50,000. So we are in a really unusual position, not just nationally, but in especially the Midwest. So what does that do to our housing? What it does, that top number on 2010, our housing to household, right? How many places to live do we have and how many families do we have? And does it make sense, right? Do we have the right numbers? Do we have enough places for people to live? And in 2010, we had about 7% more housing units than we had households. That was a really healthy, elastic housing market. In 2010, a lot of us could afford to buy a house. We could afford to rent an apartment in most places around the city. That was true in 2010, right? Like we had a lot of different options. Add a boatload of new people, not a lot of new housing. By 2020, we have just 2% more. We are getting painfully thin. And when we look at our peer cities, when they lost that incredible natural affordability, when that moment came for them, it was when they dropped below that one-to-one. -one, when they had less housing units for the families in their community then it becomes the competition, then it becomes this extraordinary lift, right? When you look at the city of Austin, almost exactly the same population size as the city of Columbus. The Austin region, almost exactly the same population as the Columbus region. The biggest difference for them, they don't have enough housing. They are below that one-to-one. -one. In 20, January of 2023, the average home price in Central Ohio was $323,000. In Austin, it was 599,000. Same, same, call, like same economy, same, it, it's a state capital, it's got a big state, you know, state university. It's a lot like us, but the thing they don't have is enough housing. And so you see that change. When we look down the list, you could buy a house in 2010, an average house in Central Ohio, for $134,000. 
you needed a household income of about $53,000 to become a homeowner in our community in 2010. Fast forward, this is 2020, so now three years ago, so I already bumped it up to the 323, but in 2020, we were at 265. You need a $103,000 household income to buy a house in our community today. Almost half of our families in this community do not make that much as a household. So there's half of our community that can no longer afford to get into home ownership. That's a problem. Okay, take my stick. And again, this will be up on the web so you guys can take a closer look at these statistics. But things have changed. They may not have changed for you or your family because you have stable housing, but things are changing and they're changing rapidly. So let's talk about displacement pressure. So I've got two corridors here, right? Because we're talking about corridors, right? That's where we are in this process. Phase one, we're gonna talk about corridors. What I have on the top, corridor A, we've got a number of single family homes. I've got a one corner there that's zoned for multifamily, like a little 20 unit apartment building, something that could fit into the community. Corridor B down there, that blue zoning is just single family homes again. Maybe you could fit two there. And what you have is two streets. Generally, the housing prices are about the same, 200,000 each. These are my little Intel workers up on the left, my little, my little figures. Um, Intel folks are coming in, not, not just Intel, but a lot of other jobs are coming into the community. These folks are moving into this neighborhood. They see this corridor, they like it. They wanna pick this neighborhood and they decide they have the money, right? They're coming with the resources, they can do that. In the top, we've built that 20 unit apartment building where it was zoned. In the bottom, we've just built two new houses. So these folks take their money and they start looking around. In the top case, I've got three of my, or I think I've, yeah, I have three of my um, Intel workers that end up picking condos in the multifamily building, right? They're young, they don't wanna mow a lawn, they just wanna hang out. So they buy a unit in that building. And then I've got two other guys that picked up two houses on the corridor. Little bit of a change, little bit of a change for, that, for those neighbors. On the bottom, there was no apartment building for those guys to buy, right? There was no place for them to go. So they ended up picking up the houses on the corridor they wanted to live on because they have the resources and they could come in. And so as we think about the change, Maybe the houses bump up a little bit on the top because we do have some competition, but not by much. And then when we get to the bottom, that increased competition, that is displacement. That is where we have folks that those, those housings are selling for higher values. That's gonna impact the property taxes for all the other neighbors, right? That's how it works. And so now we've got people that are being displaced out of homes and displaced out of the street they've lived on for a long time. Zoning is a big part of how we address this pressure in our communities. And then I've got Corridor C, very cleverly named uh, main streets I've got here. But for Corridor C, we're gonna talk about diversifying housing. And this is a street um, that I've mapped out that looks a lot like mine. I live in an older part of the city. We have a lot of naturally different types of housing in our street, right? We've got some duplexes, I've got some rentals. I've got a little, one of those little 20 unit apartment buildings that was probably built in the 60s. Um, we have some row houses at the end of the street that are a foot homeowner. They're small and they're modest and they're coming in at a really decent price point. This street has naturally occurring affordability because of the diversity of housing. Different price points, different sizes, meeting people's needs, right? Not just that single family um, street. And what we end up having right now, and I know this is gonna get me at some point, I feel like I'm tempting the gods, but if my street burned down tomorrow and we had to rebuild it, the only thing you could build back on my street right now would be single family homes. And so what happens to all those opportunities for my neighbors? who were living in either the row houses, where they're two bedroom, one bath, really nice and fixed up, but they're not clocking in nearly the price point that we see on those single family homes. And so going, going back, I'm almost done, and we can get to the fun part of the conversation, but as we go back to the things that, that Kevin talked about and the ways in which zoning and housing are really gonna intersect, we go back to the map, right? How much and where and what type of housing do we permit? And this is the incredible opportunity that zoning gives us. We as a community are gonna decide where our new neighbors would best be, right? What's the best spot for them to go and how do we proactively have that conversation as a community? First, we're gonna look at the corridors and we're gonna figure out like, are there places in each of our communities throughout the city of Columbus where that would be somewhere where our new neighbors could go? We talk about and we use density a lot but what we're talking about when we talk about density is places for people to live. And that's what we want to make sure is available, right? So your kids can come back into your neighborhood. They can enjoy the type of lifestyle that you provided them. All of those opportunities are slipping away. Um, the process, uh, I'm sure you guys are well aware, as council member mentioned, by the time you get to the city council part of the stop, you're probably, as of last year, you're probably to get residential rezoned in the city at about an eight-month timeline. 
that's time, that's money. There are boatloads of projects that never make it to the council member's docket, right? Because at some point they can't afford to make that project go all the way through. It takes too long, it's too expensive, there's too many people, designers and architects and engineers, they have to hire to get that ball across the finish line. That is a really big challenge for adding supply to our community. And then the final piece is just the standards and regulations, right? How do we, um, not just the use, but how do we look at things like setbacks and um, other components of the site that help us add a little bit more of the, of the density in our communities? I think I'm almost done. Oh, okay, we're at the Kumbaya slides now. <laughs> I'm gonna finish it up strong. So this again is probably hard, a little bit hard to read, but what I wanna talk about here, this is my housing balance slide. Again, we talked in the beginning about how zoning is one tool in our toolbox to help us deal with the, zone, with the housing issues we're facing. At the top of the, of the Venn diagram, turned into a flower, we've got build enough housing, right? We've talked about that a bunch tonight. We need the supply, we need the new units, that's really important. On the right hand side, we wanna make sure we're including affordability in all our communities, right? That's something that's really valuable. On the left hand side of the thing, we wanna make sure that we're housing our most vulnerable, right? We wanna think about housing justice. We wanna make sure that we're putting in protections. The work that city council is doing, that's all really important. And on the bottom, I think what's really important to all of us that love Columbus is we wanna continue to see Columbus be a great place great neighborhoods and beautiful streets and things that we love about our communities, all those things are fair. Not one of them can be the only thing. We have to strike a balance and each tool helps us do different things. But our job as a community is to figure out how to balance all those different things at the same time. We cannot lean into one of those bubbles and that be the only thing that we're passionate or, or fighting for around housing. We have to walk and chew gum if we're gonna be the first region to get this right. And then my final kumbaya slide, this is a come together solution. Again, I've talked tonight about what the city's doing. There are a lot of partners in this room that are working on housing and thinking about all the challenges we're facing. What you see up there is also the role of the community, right? And the important role that you all have, the fact that all of you, to council members' point, have come out on a ridiculously beautiful evening to talk about zoning and housing is really hopeful and makes me feel really good about the community part of this wedge, right? And how do we get all our partners working together so that we can be a place that grows economically, that adds jobs and has this really attractive place for people to come and move into our community and be a place where all our families can afford to live and be a place where you can be a barista and have decent housing, safe and stable, where you can be a social worker, where you can be a nurse. All those things are risk right now. The folks that are serving our health care, the folks that are serving us and, and checking us out at the grocery store, those are the folks that are next on that list of being in crisis. And so how do we come together as a community with all of our different partners to make sure that we're the community that gets it right? And I think there's a couple more slides. I think Leslie's gonna come up and talk about things. Um, so that is the, and I think we're gonna do a little bit of uh, conversation and activity around it, but um, again, my name is Aaron Prosser. I'm the Assistant Director of Housing Strategies for the City of Columbus. I'm happy to talk to any of you about any of the other parts of the process that we're working on and things that we're, we're undertaking as a city um, and appreciate everybody's time and attention tonight. Thank you, Aaron. All right, so um, we're gonna move into the conversation portion of the evening tonight. Um, so a couple things uh, that I just wanna note. Um, so uh, obviously, as you've heard, I think from all three of our speakers today, we don't have solutions right now, and that is what this opportunity is for, is for you to become part of that solution. So right now, we are looking to learn more about what you love about your communities, learn more about what you feel like your communities need. Um, this is, you know, as Kevin said, we are not moving into the residential areas quite yet. Um, that work will come later, but all of us have a main street in our community. All of us have parts of this city that we love. Um, this is not limited to the Clintonville area or even the north side of Columbus, and so, you know, please think broadly as you're going through. Um, what we've got going on here is uh, obviously we were not expecting quite the turnout that we got and so again thank you for coming out on the tables and then we're going to create another option here for folks who are not at tables um, you have these worksheets with these prompts what we would like you to do is as a group talk about you know these these prompts so we're asking things like um, uh, you know, what you feel like the housing needs of your neighborhood are. So to Aaron's point, I know in my neighborhood on the west side, it's kind of hard to find somewhere that my elderly mother was going to be able to stay, right? 
are, what are those kind of unique housing needs that you're seeing? Um, the, uh, and then also kinds of what services and amenities you, do you think would support additional housing in your neighborhood? Just, you know, kind of have these conversations. We want the group to just kind of be talking about it. If you could be jotting some notes for us so that we can collect that feedback, certainly, and bring it back to our technical team as we're kind of noodling this around, um, that would be very helpful. Uh, you don't need to agree on these. You don't need to, like, vote at your table and come to a consensus. Um, uh, that would probably be impossible, right? Um, so, you know, feel free to jot whatever you want on there. Again, we will be collecting these at the end of the night. What my team is doing right now is, um, for those of you that are not sitting at tables, we still would absolutely like you to participate. And so we have gotten some flip chart paper. We're gonna have these questions up here on the slide. Um, and so we would like you to do the same thing, right? Cluster together, you know, share ideas, talk through, um, you know, we did uh, this uh, at Reeve Avenue the other day and it was just really interesting how the conversation kind of flows, right? When you get a bunch of, bunch of brains in the room. Um, so make sure that you are capturing that. The other thing also is um, some of you might have questions. This is a very large group and we have um, limited time because we want to be respectful of this sunny evening. And so if you have questions that you would like to ask the tech team, I have uh, plenty of people that are super knowledgeable about this. Just shoot your hand up and somebody will come over to your table. Um, oh, yeah, okay, all of my tech people, shoot your hand up, right? So as you can see, I got you covered. If you have questions, we can try and help have, provide some answers. Although again, we don't have all of the solutions figured out at this point, right? We're not at that stage. So uh, we will answer to the best that we can. Oh, I am so sorry. <laughs> my name is Leslie Westerfeld and I am um, on the communications and engagement team for this project. And so uh, myself and where's my team here? James, uh, Glynis, anyways. We are here to make sure that we are providing avenues for you to participate in this process. Um, the other thing, so just two housekeeping things before I turn you loose. Um, if you did not sign in, we would appreciate it if you did. Also, this is how we get your email address and keep you updated. This is not the only um, discussion community conversation that we are having. Um, so we are having some additional ones about Main Street corridors. We're having some about how the development process in Columbus works. Um, and we are having one about businesses as well. Um, so please sign in so that we have your um, email and we will make sure that you get information about those. Also in July and August, as the technical team has continued to kind of work through some of these um, challenges and what we uh, might seek to modernize, we are going to be having workshops then later this summer where we'll start to dive into those details a little bit more, right? And get a little bit more specific. And so if you can join us for that, that would also be fantastic. Um, the other thing is, uh, before we wrap up, we will do kind of a large group report out just to kind of hear what people were talking about. And then we will have a final um, session evaluation. It'll take you one minute, I promise, right? But just let us know, are we doing this right or should we be changing something, okay? All right, so please talk. Um, if you are sitting somewhere, please kind of cluster. I think I've got a station back there. I got two back here. We'll put one right up here. Um, so please. Think, discuss. Yes, absolutely. So, then why, why can't Columbus do that? She'd be on your list. I want to see retail on the ground floor. So the lots, you're pretty restricted on high street, sir. The actual number of jobs that residential higher density. What are the things? Are there like a report out?